I have always been fascinated by flight. In fact, my first word was kite. The first film I saw in the cinemas was Superman. I was five. I became obsessed. I would wear my mother's scarves around my neck and stand in front of a fan so that my cape would flap in the wind. Also, I have strong memories of seeing hang gliders outside my bedroom window and wishing I could be up there, flying over Rio de Janeiro. These days, I can sort of fly when I film with the drone. Here I am cycling near my house in Brighton. If you look closely, you can see the controller attached to my handlebars. It's kind of a magical way to spend an afternoon, I must say, gliding around, listening to music. In consonants and vowels, I disemboweled myself nightly. And I meant every single word, you mustn't take this lightly. I tore my heart apart in tiny pieces. It's yours now to devour, but I feel defeated because nobody's listening. Nobody's listening to my. Drones are everywhere these days. It seems like every YouTube video, documentary, and student film has sweeping aerial shots now. It's become cliche, but I'm still compelled by them. I mean, look at these shots. It just flies so smoothly. With this drone, I can see my environment in a way I never could before. Gliding over the city like this feels liberating. For better or worse, we're living in the age of the drone now. This moment reminds me of the interwar years of the 1920s and 30s. It's 1919, and fighting in France halted eight months ago. Those decades were a pivotal moment for the expansion of commercial aviation, much like the current moment is for the expansion of unmanned aerial vehicles. Before the Great War, flying was a sport, but in wartime it became a huge industry. The Royal Air Force in Britain became the world's largest air force with over 22,000 airplanes, 103 airships, and 700 aerodromes. Hundreds of thousands of men and women were trained as pilots, mechanics, aerial photographers, and so on. And they all needed post-war employment. After the war, it transformed into a widespread commercial activity. After the war, with all these surplus airplanes, a lot of the fellows who had been taught to fly then decided to go out and carry passengers and do stunts and regular exhibition flying, principally at the county fairs and state fairs and things of that sort. These years saw a rapid expansion in airmail around the world. It was an era where pilots were constantly looking for new flying records to break. So pilots like Charles Lindbergh, Amelia Earhart, and Amy Johnson became household names. And here is where I get to tell you about one of my great uncles, Cyril Taylor. Married to my grandmother's sister, he was an Englishman who lived most of his life in Argentina. In the early 1920s, he ended up working for a company that administered cattle ranches in the Pampas. In this job, he learned that ranch owners were interested in using light aircraft for transportation between their properties, often hundreds of miles apart. With this in mind, he joined forces with an ex-RAF pilot to set up an agency to sell British light aircraft in Argentina. He was only 22 years old. The following year, he got his pilot's license and took over the business. He changed its name to Aerofotos and focused the business on aerial photography. Looking at some of the over 20,000 photos they took over Argentina and Uruguay in the 20s and 30s for their government and commercial clients, and comparing them to what we can see now using Google Earth, one can see several interesting things. For instance, when we compare this photo of La Casa Rosada, Argentina's presidential palace, with what we can see now on Google Earth, we see how much Buenos Aires has grown. Google Earth also allows us to fly over the city and get more of a three-dimensional understanding of the distances between these surviving aerial photos. We can glide over here to the Congress building and see how the neighborhood has changed in the last 80 or 90 years. Then we can zip over to the monument of the Magna Carta and the four regions of Argentina in the Palermo neighborhood. Here, you start to see some of the limitations of Google Earth's algorithmic rendering of the city. In Cyril's photograph, you see the 1920s cars and horse-drawn carriages driving down Avenida Libertador, but the present-day image has no such equivalence because the cars have been intentionally removed from the street. 
You can see the digital artifacts of these camouflaging redactions on the street itself. People, too, have been carefully scrubbed out. So although it seems like when you use Google Earth that the entire world has been captured in minute detail, you will never find yourself in it. Together with all this aerial photography, Aerophotos continued to sell British light aircraft in South America, and it was one of these sales that inspired Cyril to do something truly remarkable. In 1930, a new ultralight aircraft hit the market, the Comper Swift, which was surprising the aviation world with how much was possible using such a small frame. Designed by Nicholas Comper, a British military reconnaissance pilot, this aircraft was his crowning achievement. Along with competing designers such as de Havilland, Comper had been trying to kickstart a market for commercial light aircraft with planes that were cheaper and small enough to be housed in a garage. The idea was that flying could be something that the average person could afford to do. So for between 400 and 550 pounds, which would be between 24,000 and 34,000 pounds today, the Comper Swift came with a 75 horsepower engine and a maximum speed of 118 miles per hour, not far short of the RAF fighters of the day. Then, in 1931, the Swift gained international recognition with this historic record-breaking flight. And in another field of single-engine transport, C.A. Butler that year flew a Comper Swift from England to Darwin in nine days, two hours, 29 minutes, the smallest aircraft ever to make the trip, breaking C.W.A. Scott's record set a few months previously by an hour and 52 minutes. In his autobiographical book, Flight to a Lady, Butler describes the Swift like a thoroughbred. Its well-balanced controls so sensitive, they seem to react immediately to one's thoughts by responding to the slightest touch and making the aircraft a joy to handle. Impressed by the Comper Swift's remarkable performances in King's Air Races and by Butler's record-breaking flight, my great-uncle Cyril became the representative in Argentina for the Comper Swift, and a demonstration plane was shipped to him. When it arrived, he got talking to a friend who was interested in the plane as Cyril himself describes it in a letter to the editor of Aeroplane magazine many years later. A close friend of mine, Charles Bell, had taken a flying course at the school I was running alongside my aerial photographic business. He was much interested in the Comper, but he didn't believe the performance figures given in the specifications. Charles, who was later killed in an aircraft accident, was well endowed with this world's goods, and I jokingly asked him if he'd place an order for a Comper Swift if I manage to get across the Andes in the demonstration aircraft. He promptly took me up on the suggestion and the flight was organized. And just like that, Cyril set off to attempt something that no one else had ever done before, to fly the smallest ever open cockpit, single propeller plane over the Andes mountain range. He registered the demonstration plane with the Argentinian aviation authorities and christened it the Hummingbird. The date for the flight was set for March 9th, 1932. Cyril also arranged for some sponsorship for the flight in return for publicity, chief among them, mobile oil. Then, once he had everything in place and was ready to go, he took off from Mendoza at 7.20 a.m. If Cyril were still alive and I was able to interview him about this flight, I imagine it could have gone something like this. Contact. They said it was too dangerous, that the weather conditions over the Andes were too unpredictable, that the plane was too small and light to handle the winds, that a 75 horsepower engine wouldn't be strong enough to reach the necessary altitude, but I was still confident. It's true that all previous crossings of the Andes had been flown with higher powered aeroplanes. The previous record holder was Adrian Bolland the first female pilot to make the run, by the way, and she flew in a Cordron biplane, which had an 85 horsepower engine, I believe, but the Compass Swift was much smaller and lighter and therefore didn't need as much power to achieve similar results. So, I wasn't particularly worried about the plane, but I did worry a bit about oxygen. Panagua Airways had lent me an oxygen tank, but in Mendoza, when we tried fitting it to the Swift before takeoff, it was just too big, so, I had to leave without it. As I climbed higher and higher, approaching the Upsalata Pass, I began to feel very cold and my, my temples were pounding from the lack of oxygen. I made sure to keep Aconcagua, the tallest mountain of the range, to the north. 
That way I could use the mountain as a shield against the more dangerous gusts of wind buffeting down from further up. The higher I went, the colder it became. In fact, my temperature readings throughout the flight varied from 40 degrees centigrade to 18 degrees below. Once I reached the Upsalata Pass, Aconcagua emerged before me in all her glory. The skies were so clear it was truly breathtaking. I could see the winds blowing spirals of snow off the peaks, which glistened in the sun. I somehow managed to take a photograph as I passed. Not easy, mind you, in a small single-seater aircraft. I was able to take it one-handed, without looking through the viewfinder. I still can't quite believe how well it came out. To my knowledge, this is the first photograph of Mount Aconcagua to be taken from the air. Ultimately, I managed to climb as high as 18,200 feet, not quite high enough to fly over Aconcagua, but higher than Bolland had managed 11 years earlier, even in this minuscule plane. And then as I saw the vast expanse before me, it dawned on me that I had crossed the border and consequently the highest portion of the range. I was suddenly overcome by what I had just accomplished. I was now an Andes Crossing record holder. Not bad for a 27-year-old who only just trained as a pilot four years prior. <laughs> Charlie had better start picking out which colour Swift he wants, I thought. After weaving through some of the lower mountains, I lost my way a bit. But then I saw the town of Los Andes, and railroad tracks heading out from there to Valparaiso, so I followed them. As I approached the Santiago Basin, I could see that a thick fog had rolled in over the city, and I wouldn't be able to land there. I had to find an alternative. When I found a clearing, I spiralled down into a field which turned out to be outside the town of Nogales, 120 miles from Santiago. The rough landing also damaged my propeller, which would inevitably complicate my return. But I'd, I'd sort that out later. First, I had to telegram the chaps at Compa and Mobile Oil and let them know that I'd been successful. To the Compa boys, I wrote, Crossed Andes safely this morning at 18,000 feet. This constitutes record for lightest plane to cross Andes. Time employed, one hour, 50 minutes. Taylor. Immediately after, I sent out the press releases. The Chilean military authorities made me a new propeller, and soon I was able to fly to Santiago. A banquet was held in my honour, where I met with various authorities connected to civil and military aviation, who were all very kind and helpful. Three demonstrations of the Swift were carried out for them, and the chief of the military airport, Comandante Montesino, asked to fly the plane. He was quite astounded by the performance. All in all, my reception in Chile was excellent, and I obtained some very good publicity. All the major papers in Argentina and Chile ran articles on my flight, as well as some pieces in the English press. On top of that, my record was used in adverts to sell the Compa Swift, Mobile Oil, KLG spark plugs, and even Halsey hats. When I eventually got back to uh, Buenos Aires, Charlie did put in an order for a Compa Swift, as agreed. It cost him 4,000 Argentine pesos, but, well, a wager is a wager, after all. The colour he chose was canary yellow. It was a beauty. A few years later, in 1936, he died in a crash, of course, so this memory is rather bittersweet for me. But um, I'm getting ahead of myself. On the flight back from Santiago to Mendoza, something rather remarkable happened to me that I've been struggling to understand ever since. I was worried about the performance of the new propeller that the Chilean military had refashioned for me from a decommissioned de Havilland moth. I wasn't sure that it would give me the same lift that my original propeller had, but nevertheless I set off back across the Andes. Once again I managed to climb to 14,500 feet. However, this time I did so too quickly, and as a result I blacked out. <laughs> I began to see things, flashes of images. In a blur, I saw the evolution of aviation, from balloons to the failed attempts at powered flight, then liftoff and biplanes were born. I saw what seemed to be military uses of aeroplanes from the Great War. Reconnaissance, mostly, I believe. Uh, photographs taken from the air, that sort of thing. Images I remember seeing as a child in magazines and newsreels. It was images like these from above the front lines that made me want to be a pilot in the first place. And then suddenly, I understood modern art. Those abstract paintings looked like the shapes of the landscape below. I could now see that artists were responding to this brand new perspective on the world. 
It was disorientating, all these new machines everywhere. Cars, trains, planes, everything was faster. Distances felt shorter. How could all these changes not affect the way we saw the world? That smashed and fractured perspective of cubism finally made sense to me, and it was beautiful. Then, from the Eiffel Tower, I began going up and up and up. I understand now that this was a vision about the birth of spaceflight when we started sending satellites into space. Some three minutes later, Explorer is in orbit, broadcasting to the world its coded scientific data. I was high above the Earth, so high that I could see it in its entirety. It looked like one of those desktop globes. Many years later, I realized that what I had seen was actually the famous blue marble photograph taken by astronauts on the way to the moon. Seeing the world like that was truly breathtaking. It was the ultimate aerial photograph, for it contained all of humanity within it. I then saw the Earth surrounded by thousands of satellites. They clung to the planet like lint on a black dinner jacket. The area around us was absolutely littered with them. These satellites orbiting the planet were constantly photographing and collecting data about the Earth and the life on it, weather patterns, deforestation, changing global temperatures and also military surveillance. I saw what looked like very small planes with no windows, too small for there to have been any pilots inside. I saw soldiers looking at cinema screens and electronic controls. I saw what looked like reconnaissance photographs from the Great War, but in motion. In these images, I saw buildings being bombed. I saw cars being shot. It seemed to me that military pilots could now fly their warplanes remotely and be able to shoot the enemy without putting themselves in danger. There even seemed to be miniature reconnaissance helicopters that soldiers used in combat on the ground. So, as I floated above the earth, seeing the beauty of the oceans, clouds and diverse landscapes below, I was struck by the amazing feats that we as a species can achieve, how we can conquer the skies, overcome even the most formidable mountains, and even venture out into space, but also that these almost godlike abilities to be all-knowing and all-powerful should be kept in check. I wondered if we can be trusted with this much power, and what it would mean if we couldn't. And then, I fell back to Earth. Back to my compass swift as it plummeted. <gasps> I suddenly felt my hands on the controls and leveled myself out before I crashed into the side of a mountain. I'd only been unconscious for six seconds, but what I had seen would stay with me for the rest of my life. When World War II broke out, foreigners were banned from flying in Argentina. As a result, Cyril had to sell his business. He was too old to join the RAF, so he spent most of the war years working on the construction of roads and air bases in Paraguay. After the war, he returned to Argentina and had a long career as a corporate executive, but he never flew again. Out of hope and hunger's reach Clinging to the underbelly By the skin of rotting teeth Hold me harshly from existence Let your sewer flood my sea What's the city holds called distance From its own humanity Feel my feeble body start to wave 